Um, I'm wearing two different hats this evening as I welcome you. Um, first of all, in my role as co-director of the Center for India and South Asia Research, uh, and secondly, as one of the steering committee members of the UBC Himalaya program. And this evening is a joint event uh, put on by both of our programs, and it's really exciting to be able to find that intersection uh, between those of us with interests in the Himalayan region, those of us with broader interests in South Asia, and of course those of us with broader interests in education development and technology. Uh, this evening's event is also co-sponsored by the UBC Language Sciences Research Cluster, as well as the Language and Literacy Education Department and the Faculty of Educational Studies. And it's really a pleasure uh, to work with such a diverse group of colleagues uh, to bring an event like this to you. Um, I would just like to ask my colleague, Leah McFadgen, uh, to say a few words on behalf of LLED, and then I'll continue with a few more words about our other programs before we get on to this evening's um, event. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am indeed from Language and Literacy Education. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Teresa Dob Dobson. Uh, we also um, are responsible for UBC's Master of Educational Technology degree program. Um, so I'm hoping that lots of our remote students will be watching this evening, Robbie, those who are interested in educational technology and development. And I just wanted to let you know, many of you may know this already, that as a follow-on from this event, we are holding a couple of panel discussions tomorrow afternoon with Raubi and a number of our colleagues from the campus and uh, other um, colleagues locally who uh, do work in or about Nepal. Um, if any of you would like to attend that and haven't registered for it yet, you'd be very welcome to do so. And please come and let me know and I'll make sure you have the right information. Thanks, Leah. Um, I would also uh, <coughs> like to thank our uh, co-sponsor, uh, the Nepal, <coughs> sorry, Nepal Library Foundation, uh, especially uh, Naresh Koirala and um, Paul and Alison Bird, who are here this evening, uh, who made uh, the initial suggestion that, in fact, uh, Rabbi Karmacharya would be a wonderful speaker uh, to bring uh, to this audience in Vancouver and at UBC. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see it come to fruition uh, through collaboration. So thank you to all of the co-sponsors. Um, just a few words about uh, the various programs that I mentioned. Uh, the Himalaya program uh, focuses on that broad region in a trans-regional and transdisciplinary sense. Uh, we host a series of events uh, focused on many different aspects of um, contemporary and historical uh, life across the Himalayas. We have a series going on this term and there's a poster uh, just out behind uh, the door where you can uh, get information about our other upcoming events and we also have a, a, a website uh, where you can subscribe to our email list to receive further updates. Uh, so please do sign in. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet on the yet back and uh, that will be going around if you can just sign your name. Uh, that would help us uh, also to document the event. Um, the Center for India and South Asia Research also has a seminar series. Uh, this is the kickoff event of the term for both programs and the CSAR poster is also uh, out there for you to consult and uh, understand about other further events coming up and we would love to see you uh, back in the future. Um, one of the other things that the Himalaya program does that I'd like to mention is to run a series of community engaged summer intensive language courses. Uh, there is a two week course in Tibetan and a two week course in Nepali languages. Uh, those will be offered again this year uh, during the first two weeks of May in that funny time period between the end of uh, the UBC winter term and beginning of the summer term. Uh, we're just finalizing details but information should be going out soon so if you're interested in that uh, intensive language learning experience uh, here in Vancouver uh, with uh, members of the Nepali and Tibetan communities. Please just put your name on the mailing list and then you will uh, get updates when the uh, final dates and enrollment details are set and that should be coming out fairly soon. 
Um, just a few other small housekeeping details. A couple of people have asked where the washrooms are, if you're not familiar with this building. Uh, they're just out uh, across the kind of lobby uh, entrance, uh, and you can find them there. Uh, we have a little bit more uh, food, but quite a bit more uh, chia, uh, Nepali uh, masala tea, out in the hallway. So uh, please do feel free to refill your cups and help yourselves later. Uh, finally, this event is live streaming uh, this evening, and we're really glad to be able to offer um, that feature. It's, uh, we haven't always been able to do so uh, with past events, and so welcome to everybody who may be watching online. Uh, for anybody who would like to share the link uh, with friends or colleagues, I'm sorry, it's not up on the screen, uh, but if you can go to the UBC Himalaya program Twitter or Facebook page or our website, uh, this event listing, you'll find it there and it can be shared from there. It will also be archived uh, in due course and available on the Himalaya program website to view. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to um, welcome Mark Turin, one of my colleagues on the UBC Himalaya Program Steering Committee, uh, in order to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, before I introduce uh, our speaker this evening, I'd like to just acknowledge and recognize that this talk is taking place on Musqueam territory, traditional, ancestral, and unceded Musqueam territory. And I'd like to use that as an opportunity to not reflect only on kind of how we do that performatively at UBC, but think more critically about what it means to do such a land acknowledgement. I'd like it to be something that isn't just a footnote or a disclaimer before we move on to the meat of the conversation. Let's recall that uh, learning and teaching Digital and, of course, analog has been going on at Musqueam for thousands of years, long before this university was established, just over 100 years now. Rabbi Karmacharya is a social entrepreneur who helped launch Open Learning Exchange Nepal with the vision to use technology to improve the quality of primary education in Nepal's public schools and along the way to transform the way that children learn through engagement, exploration and experimentation. Rabi has extensive experience in technological innovation and management and has a firm conviction that I've witnessed myself in Nepal that young educated Nepalis have a critical role to play in developing uh, and changing in many ways their own nation. Uh, prior to launching Oli Nepal in 2007, uh, he had all kinds of different roles and responsibilities. I won't read them out. I will note he holds a master's and a bachelor's uh, from MIT. He worked in California for many years and has also been named the Asia Society Asia 21 Young Leader and more recently the Asia 21 Fellow. Um, Rabi is also no stranger to the west coast of Canada. I should add that in the early 90s he completed his international baccalaureate at the Lester Pearson United World College in Victoria. So welcome back to the west coast, Rabi. And thank you for coming all the way from Nepal to share your work with us in what I know will be a really inspiring and educational evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mark, for the <coughs> introduction, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, uh, Naristi, Paul, and all the folks who worked to uh, bring me here to give this talk. So, like Mark said, my connection to the West Coast here goes almost 30 years back. And uh, al almost 30 years ago, the first time I actually left Nepal and I landed in Vancouver and to attend uh, uh, Lester uh, B. Pearson College, I arrived there and then someone there asked me, do you have a jet lag? And I had no idea what a jet lag was back then. So the student from Pakistan, Aisha, had to explain to me what a jet lag was. And I don't think I had a jet lag back then, I was so excited. But I couldn't say the same about today. I landed yesterday, I still have a little jet lag. So hopefully, you know, uh, I'll be able to, I'll have enough energy to go through this. And um, so I think the other part of uh, Pearson College for me and Leah here, who is also two years ahead of me in Pearson College, it's an amazing place where uh, we have about 200 students coming from 75 countries. They're all selected from the countries to attend this two-year program, very intensive, rigorous program, where you, you know, uh, live together with these uh, different people and learn about cultures, learn about um, uh, of their way of life, to be more accepting 
and also you know, go to the IB program. And uh, I was a pretty smart student in Nepal, and that's one of the reasons I was selected. But when I got to Pearson College, and after the first semester, I realized that almost I had to unlearn a lot of the things I had learned. And the way you know, I, 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 that we were uh, uh, taught in Nepal, you know, so I was very good in you know, regurgitating all the ma math formula, but I had very little idea about how to apply it. So that also was, I think, uh, has a little to do with where I am now and why I'm working in education. So today I'm going to talk about quality education, you know, what it means quality education and how we have been, how we see uh, an opportunity to use technology to improve the quality in education in many of these remote rural areas. And I'll talk about what we've been doing so far. So I'll give you a brief overview of all in Nepal. I'll talk a little bit about education and development, the, uh, the situation in, in, in Nepal, the challenges we face in education. Although I will talk about Nepal, I think it's, uh, it can be applied to many developing countries, as I was just having a short chat earlier with Leah and one of her colleagues from LLE. Uh, you know, we're talking about Ethiopia, and we talk about different other countries. Uh, we have very similar challenges. And the rationale behind why you know, we're using technology uh, in, in classrooms. I'll talk about all in Nepal's programs, what are the results that we, we've seen so far, what are the lessons and challenges from our experience, and looking ahead, you know, where we see ourselves moving ahead. So, uh, like Mark said earlier, this Open Learning Exchange, OLE Nepal, is a social benefit organization, and our mission is to enhance the quality of education and to improve access to quality educational materials and educational opportunities through the use of integration, through the integration of technology in classrooms. And when we talk about technology, especially when we come to academic institutions like UBC, and we always think of you know, technology as being this very cutting edge, connected, and that kind of technology. But what we are actually grappling with are not so much about this fast internet connection, but how you know, we can use very rudimentary, very basic technology just to provide that access and quality in classrooms. So All in Nepal was established in 2007. It was a group of us from different professional backgrounds. We felt that there was this window of opportunity for us to come in, work with the government to introduce uh, a, a, a different innovative way of teaching and learning in classrooms. And we had this conviction, we just left our different jobs, came together to establish Ole Nepal. And um, what, what really struck us, you know, uh, most of us, and when I even used to do a lot of traveling in Nepal, is the kind of disparity in the access to education, disparity in quality of education. And we felt and, uh, that we need to do something about it. And when the first meetings that we had at the ministry, we registered in September, October, we were already at the Ministry of Education. Uh, we were talking about partnership, and then we also, this one of the things that we told the, uh, the uh, officials at ministry was that the use of technology, I mean, there's in, increasingly, even back in 2007, 2008, many of the children, many of the students in private schools, in, in places where parents can afford these access to technology, they're already using them to sort of get ahead. And we already have the disparity in access between public schools and private schools, between you know, uh, students from marginalized communities to students in urban well-off areas. So if we do not act then, I think this, this, this gap is going to be so wide that it will be very difficult to bridge that later on. So we managed to convince the ministry to partner with us because we also were clear that the only way to reach all the children in Nepal was to work with the ministry because as an organization we can only reach certain number of, of students but if we want to bring that transformation we have to change the plans and policies in the ministry and that's what we've also accomplished in, in the last 10 years. So this is reality. This is actually what we see, a tale of two classrooms in, in, in Nepal. The one that you see on your left is from in the far west. It's one of the schools we are working with right now. This is our one of our initial visits. This is very common to see classrooms like this. And this, believe it or not, is a school in Kathmandu. Now, this is what struck us and said, okay, if we, and then majority of the students are studying in public schools like that. So we felt, okay, what can we do? 
So briefly, just for those of you who may not be familiar with Nepal, this is, uh, just, I'll just run through a few slides about Nepal. Uh, it's about similar population as Canada. And, uh, but if you see the trade deficit, we, we uh, have more, we import a lot more than what we export. Uh, if you look at GDP by sector, we have mostly agriculture, tourism, and lately, you know, although everyone thinks of tourism when you think of Nepal, and then, you know, we have, we put a lot of investment and focus in tourism, but a lot of our foreign currency income comes from remittance. So these are many people, Nepalese, young Nepalese, who go to work in uh, Gulf countries in Malaysia, and they send money home. So. Uh, in the last like decade or so, or, or uh, 15, 16 years, this is what has been keeping the economy going. So uh, in the last 10 years, 3.5 million permits were granted from the government, and there are many others who go through the informal channels because they cannot get the permit. They go to India and then go from there to work in different, very harsh conditions, very difficult conditions. And this is also a lot of bearing in the overall economy as well as education because many young people are now their, their goal is to go and find a job somewhere outside instead of staying in school. But then if we can give them a certain amount of skills, if they have certain skills, they can go and make much more money. So that's also another aspect that's, that's uh, drawn attention in Nepal. Um, so until 1951, education was almost not open to public. It was only for the few rule, ruling class people. And in 51 was when education was opened up to public, but the concept of mass education was introduced only in 1974. Right now we have about 7.3 million school age children, and the number of schools, if you look at it, is about 35,000. Now that is a huge jump. In 1974 there were about 4,000 schools. So we went to, from 4,000 schools to 35,000 schools in, in this about 40, 45 years. Uh, majority of them are community schools, these are public schools, and then institutional schools are what we call private schools, about 6,500. We have uh, about 147,000 teachers, and they're permanent and temporary teachers. If you look at the overall investment in education, I mean, it's a pretty sizable amount. Um, uh, although the, there has been uh, talk about the, that uh, it should be about 20% of national budget. Right now it's about 11%. Uh, it is rising every year. There's, this is only what the uh, government has allocated, but there's a lot more that the parents who are sending their children to private schools are paying. There are also a lot of more investment by organizations like ours and INGOs who are also putting a lot of money in education. So overall, there is a quite a lot of money that goes into education in Nepal. But if you look at the government amount, what they're allocated here, most of that money about well, 70% of that goes to pay salaries. So it's not really, if you look at it, the investment is not so much on, on children, but on the salaries. And in one of the conversations I had with a young uh, leader in Nepal, he also admitted that it's almost like we keep these 35,000 schools going just to justify the salaries of, this, of all these teachers. So the outcome overall is very dismal. Um, uh, we have been very good at, at uh, achieving the quantitative goals. The number of the, uh, enroll, the enrollment rate is pretty high in Nepal. In primary level, it's about 96%. And, um, uh, but, but the thing is, the quality of education, as, I, as I'll explain uh, in subsequent slides, is, is, leaves a lot to be desired there. So what are the kind of challenges we're facing? Mostly one is the teaching learning methodologies we're using. As I said earlier, we very much rely on, we rely on road learning and memorization. Uh, there is very little emphasis on critical thinking, problem solving skills, uh, teachers do not encourage inquiry. It's just, you know, follow the book, follow the course, sit for the exam, and then hope that you pass. And it's a very passive learning environment. Um, there's very little engagement, and that's very, if you go to and walk into any classroom in Nepal, you'll see that a lot. The other aspect is the quality of the learning resources that we're using in classrooms. The textbook is all they have, very, very low uh, quality textbooks, and there's little or no use of any other teaching learning materials. So the teachers will just go to the textbook, finish it, and that was it. And then schools also lack the minimum enabling conditions 
the infrastructure, the learning resources, they're very lacking. And there is a very wide disparity in access, like I showed earlier in the, in the photograph. And this access, lack of disparity is across uh, geographic regions, student, uh, uh, families from different eco eco ethnic and economic backgrounds, socio socioeconomic backgrounds. So this is uh, what we see. You know, if you look at Nepal, we have on the north side, this is the Himalayan belt in the middle of the hills, and then in, in the south, the Tarai belt, the plains. So the Tarai region is very densely populated. And then we have the hill region, which are which have a little less dense. And then in the, in the mountain region, it's very sparsely populated. So there, there, different regions have different, they actually have different sets of challenges that you know, uh, we have to face as we try to you know, provide quality education. Um, so if you look at Tarai, the population, as you can see, is much higher there, a uh, number of schools. But then if you look at the number of schools, it's fewer schools than in the Hills re hilly region, although there are more people. So in Tarai region, if you walk into the classroom, it's typical to see about 80 students per class. And it's, in, in the summer, it gets quite hot. Uh, so it's, it's a big problem then. In the hilly region, the number of students you would find on average is about 30, 35 students in a classroom. But the challenge in the hilly region is that because you're, you know, students, especially young students, they have to walk up and down the hills you know, and walk long distance to get to schools. In the mountains, sparsely populated, it's very difficult, you know, so, you know, one community will have about 30, 40 households. To set up a school there is very challenging and very costly and, and uh, very difficult to find teachers. Uh, another aspect that's, that's very challenging is also the language of instruction. The main language of instruction is Nepali, although there is some push to make it, you know, there's, it's a new fad that you call it, we're English language, English medium school, but most of the teachers don't speak English, so they, it's, it's one way for the public schools to also try to attract students to them. There are about 123 languages spoken as mother tongue in Nepal, and so that poses a different set of challenges, especially in the early grades. So students come to the first grade in school, it's a totally new language that they're not uh, used to. And they're trying to learn math, they're learn to, trying to learn science and different, different subjects in a language that they have no idea in. So that's a, that's a very big challenge. So about 55% of the population have mother tongue that's other than Nepali. So you can imagine what the children are struggling with. So it's no wonder that you know, when, when, you, when they did an a, a evaluation about uh, four or five years ago, DFID sponsored this evaluation. They found that majority of the students in fourth grade could not even write one sentence in Nepali. And they're moving on to fifth grade, sixth grade, so they're hardly learning anything there. Recently, there has been a program called National Early Grade Reading Program that has tried to sort of address this issue by providing learning resources in different languages, but still it's in the early stage. And uh, hopefully this will actually uh, make it a little better, the whole overall situation. Um, so finally, we're talking about teachers. Uh, in Nepal and I think many other countries, teaching as a profession does not attract the best and the brightest. And uh, just to give you an example, so just earlier this year, there was uh, an opening for a few, about a few thousand seats in, in, the, in the government public schools. And, uh, 22,000 temporary teachers who were already teaching in schools sat for this exam. Out of them, about 40% failed the exam. And these are teachers who were already teaching in, this school, in the schools. They could not even score 40 out of 100 to pass this exam. And 40 out of 100 in subjects they're already teaching in class in schools. So this is the kind of situation we face in terms of qualification of teachers. You know, when you go to the far west, in many of the schools we go to, it's very difficult to find a qualified teacher. So qualification is a big problem. So there's very low motivation among teachers, high absenteeism. We, I remember when we started this program, when we started working in education, one of the issues that everyone brought up was the absenteeism among students. But when we go to schools, I hardly find a single day when all the teachers are present. There's always, you know, if you have five teachers, one, two, or three would be absent. Or oh, someone has an exam, someone has a family program, someone's not well. So I have, to date, 
haven't been able to find. Even when they know we're coming, they will, all the teachers will not be present. So very high absenteeism. And that's one of the reasons the teachers are engaged in many other things in the villages. Teaching is just one of the things they do. And uh, lack of accountability. So if your students are not performing well, the teachers are just, you know, nothing happens to teachers. No one takes actions against them. So that's also an, an issue. Uh, teacher to student ratio. In the, in the villages, in the rural areas, the problem is there are no teachers. So you have, even in primary, you go from grade one to five, there are five different classes, there will be three teachers or two teachers. So that's all, all, not a big problem. Whereas in urban areas, in Kathmandu, even in lower secondary school, I find 22 teachers that go up to grade eight. So there's most, most of the teachers want to stay in the urban areas, do not want to go to rural areas. And there's very little that the government can do about it because most of the teachers have the unions and their political backings. So it's very difficult to uh, send teachers to the places where there's more need. And there's also issues related to attitude and hierarchy. So there are senior teachers, junior teachers. When we work in schools, we find that junior teachers are more enthusiastic. They're more interested to learn, to apply innovative ideas. The older teachers just say, I've been teaching for 30 years. My students have become doctors and engineers. I don't need to do any of this. But, and what also that adds is that the older teachers refuse to learn from the younger teachers. With technology, with the new innovative uh, approaches, the younger teachers pick, it, pick up much quicker. And we always insist, why don't you, when the older teachers, work with these teachers who are, you know, who have actually picked up the skills pretty well. For them, it's because of the hierarchy, the senior teachers would never go and ask help from the senior junior teachers. So that kind of hierarchy makes it very challenging uh, here. And I, like I said, political interference, it's, uh, I think that's true in many other countries as well. So one of the things I want to add here is when I said you know, teaching as a profession does not attract the best and the brightest, I also look at who are the people who actually end up becoming teachers. So uh, in, in Nepal and like many other countries in, in South Asia as well, is the teach students who perform well in the high school they take what we call science stream. That is the most coveted one, and it's only like if you score like 80, 90 percent, you go into sciences, which means you become doctors and engineers. If you're anywhere between 60 and 70, you go to the arts. Oh no, actually you do commerce. You go into business, you become CA. Below that, you go into arts, and that's where you go into, uh, you know, the, among them, the bright ones will go into politics, you know, find their way there. And the remainder, one of the things they choose is teaching. And among those very low performing students who go on to become teachers, among them, the best ones are high school teachers, because high school you know, require very uh, better skills. So who become the primary school teachers are the ones who even perform the lower among that group. So that's the irony, right? So when you, when, when you, have, to be, you have to put more resource and emphasis on the foundation, we have the worst in the lot. Uh, I mean, again, this is generalization. I'm not saying there are teachers. There are, you know, we have come across many teachers who are quite dedicated. But this is kind of generalization what we find in our education system. So recently, the government has a new school structure. We have basic and secondary. Basic goes from uh, early, early uh, childhood development, ECD, that's one year, and then grades one to eight. This is made mandatory now and free although it's not always free yet, but that's the, that's the goal here. Secondary education, 9 to 12, it's very interesting that we have this choice between academic stream and a vocational stream. I think that has a little to do with creating that kind of skilled uh, uh, population, you know, among the young people who can also contribute to, you know, uh, uh, develop in the country as well as for those who opt to go work abroad can have, can earn more. We also have you know, one of the final things, you know, to make it as if we don't have enough challenge, we recently went to the federated system in Nepal. We have seven provinces now and uh, 571 lo local municipalities. So that has changed the kind of overall scenario in Nepal, edu the uh, education system. Previously, it was Department of Education, the District Education Office, Research Centers. Now there's a lot of confusion about, you know, who, who is responsible for what here. The District Education Offices have pretty much become obsolete. There's nothing they can, they can do now. And the local bodies are challenging the central authorities and saying, no, we can set our own curriculum. We will select our own teachers. It's good and bad. So I think it's a very bad idea to have 751 different kind of uh, groups setting their own curricula. 
but in terms of teachers hiring firing it'll be good if they can have if they do it sincerely and if they have that kind of power uh, so there's a lot of confusion right now about who's managing the teachers who's managing the schools for us as organizations it's slightly easier now to work with local bodies because it's it's right there they're on the they're on the ground so the teachers and the schools can go to them and say this is what we need we need more teachers so they can make that demand so they're actually closer to the communities and we found them more responsive so in summary what we look at in in education i find it uh, i call this the pyramid structure so we're very good at enrolling students in the first grade it's also because schools get certain incentives the teachers get certain incentives for enrolling students so the first two weeks in April when the school's new uh, academic year cycle begin, they go out and they have this huge campaign to enroll the students, but then immediately afterwards we the second grade, there's a high dropout rate. And about 10% of the students who enroll in grade one go on to actually uh, complete grade 10. So it's like this pyramid structure we have. Um, so among those who remain in schools, the poor performance, like I said earlier, about 55% of the students can't even score 50 in, in the school uh, secondary edu education exam. And so what we find is students are attending schools, but they are not learning. This I've also mentioned earlier. So minimum and urban conditions. So these are some of the schools we work in with. So these, this is the kind of infrastructure. These are the classrooms. And so we're trying to go in there and try to see how we can make learning more fun, more relevant, more meaningful. So it's, it's a pretty daunting task. So we started looking at technology. Again, we were very clear that technology is not going to solve all the problems. That has to be clear. So we were very clear on what technology can do and what technology cannot do. Right? So for us, it was to improve the quality. Now, how do we improve the quality? One is the learning materials, what the children are learning with. Instead of just a textbook, if we can provide more uh, interactive, you know, audiovisuals and, and uh, that kind of content, we believe that that will actually help the students learn a lot. Improve classroom practices. Instead of making these lectures, teachers just, you know, reading out the textbooks, can we make it more interactive? Can the children be doing more things on their own, asking questions and getting them engaged? Kind of create that active learning environment. Thinking abilities, that actually comes from their the opportunity that we can provide for them to explore, learn, express, share, you know, that's where actually we can build this kind of uh, skills. And to shift the focus away from teachers, like I said, all the investment, all the focus, everything we do in education is training teachers, paying their salaries, you know, making them happy, trying to motivate them. We haven't done anything for learners. Now if we can provide this kind of platform where we focus on learners now, give the children the opportunity and we see, we have found that they can also learn a lot on their own. You know, the self-learning can happen there. And then, you know, self-learning with teachers as facilitators, that's our target here. And also the uniform access to quality learning materials. With technology, I see no reason why the, the, the materials that, that, that are being used in these urban schools, in the private schools, there's no reason why we can provide the same kind of learning resources in the, urban, in the rural uh, poor areas. And although people actually balk at saying, oh, technology is expensive, but if you actually do the calculation, and if you look at the long run, I think technology, using digital technology, is one of the most cost-effective way of providing uh, quality education in, in many of these rural areas. For example, even if you think of like different languages, if we create a content and then we can translate that to different languages, then it does not require us to print books in 123 languages. We can easily make those content and in, in different languages, can be used in, in different schools and, and as per the needs of the communities. So what we do is, you know, so like I said, we were very clear on how to use, well, we're not clear. We actually did a lot of research back then. So in 2007, the trend was to put computers in schools, connect them to the internet, and wait for a miracle to happen. And all over the world, as you know, that did not happen. And one of the people that actually we, uh, was one of the people who co-founded All in Nepal with us was a, a person by the name of Mahabir Poon. He was well known for connecting schools. And he went back from, from the US 
he lived in the mountains in Magdi and he wanted to connect. He wanted to put computers in schools and connect. And he came to me one day and said, you know, Ravi, why teachers are not doing anything. Nothing is happening. So he asked the teacher, what do you need? I, I gave you internet. They said, what do we look for in the internet? Everything is English. There's nothing we can do. So then we realized, he told us, and then we started looking into it. The first thing we need is relevant content, digital content that students and teachers can use in their classrooms. So that's one of the first things you know, we started working in. And uh, when we went to the ministry and talked about this, they said, oh, yes, yes, that's a great idea. We want to digitize all our textbooks. And we said, well, not quite. That's also, that's also good. But what we want to do is if we want to really want to leverage technology, then we, are, we want to leverage the multimedia features in that to make it more interactive and learning. They didn't get it. So it was only after we made our first prototype and we presented it, that's when actually I think I saw the light bulb going on in that, in that room. And um, so we've worked a lot in digital content. Again, I mean, this is not something we knew right off the bat. You know, it, it, it's a lot of iterations and, and, and tries that we came to that. So we have the content. Now what we need to do is we've got to work with the teachers who are actually in classrooms because we're not doing it there. So like it or not, whoever teachers we have, we have to work with them. So how do we make that happen? So we uh, spend a lot of time and effort into teacher training and support. And then, of course, the technology infrastructure. Uh, we tried the first two years to connect internet to these schools, and we gave up. Because in remote areas, trying to keep this, you know, we, with Mahabirpur, and we set up all these uh, relays and connected the remote schools. But then we also realized, because we were working in primary schools, the kids really don't care so much about internet. You know, what they care about is fun games they can learn with. So after two or three years, we said, you know, let's not worry about the, about the internet. That we leave it up to the private sector and the government to do it. What we can instead do is how can we bring that all to the schools through our setting up a local server so they really don't need internet. If we can put most, a lot of these learning tools there locally, they can use it there. And very important is the building local capacity and community support, community ownership. I know it's a very kind of jargon that's used very widely in the development sector, but, um, but there are ways to do this. And now, especially with the local government, it's very interesting that we see more of this happening. Uh, for example, last year when we worked in a remote district called Darchula, there were 15 schools we worked in. The local government invested their own money to put solar panels in the 14 of the schools that did not have electricity. So we do see that kind of uh, interest coming and, and the parents and the communities are taking part more and more. So out of the four, I'm just going to go talk about, so we have the digital content. I talked about digital content earlier. There are two types of digital content that we work in right now. One is the interactive content that we create. We design and develop. Uh, these are based on the national curriculum. If you can see, you can go from grade one to eight so far in English, math, science, and Nepali. You can switch the language. You can go in Nepali or English. And like I said, it's, uh, we make it open source. Anyone, if you want to translate to a different language, they're more than welcome to do it. But the condition is that no one can charge anything for this. For us, everything we create and distribute are free. So these are grade and subject specific. This is much appreciated by teachers. So if you are a fourth grade teacher, math teacher, you go to grade four, go to math. There are different topics lined up. If you want to turn, teach about fraction division, it's right there, and they can teach it. Uh, it's interactive, fun, and engaging, and we use animation, audiovisual text. And it's also designed to promote self-learning. So even if there is a lack of good math teacher there, we want the students to be able to use it and learn on their own. And uh, these are developed by a team of curriculum experts. So these are not really, so it, we call this a very educator-driven process. It's not the software programmers who are creating this on their own, but these are designed, conceptualized by curriculum experts. They're content designers who sort of put all the parts into it. They're animators, graphic designers, and programmers who are involved in making this. So this is like simple ones that I show you here. I can give you a demo later. This is about uh, photosynthesis. This is in Nepali. So they can go through this. This is about pressure and you know when the fish goes up and down, how the pressure goes up and down. So very simple kind of animation can help students learn much better. And then also it's fun for them to do this. So I'll show you a quick demo of this.
Yeah. Pali or English. Um, choose the grade. I can go to grade second, English. So there's also what we call the activity guide. This is to help these teachers, you know, what are the, the purpose of it, how you can use. And also we talk about integrating this classroom. So we don't want, we don't believe that just doing these activities are enough for students to learn those topics. So there are many other things that we keep telling the teachers, if it has worked for you before, you know, you can still use the blackboard, still use kind of classroom-based activities, but then also use this to help students learn, uh, learn the uh, materials better, the, the topics. So this is about preposition. The elephant is behind the tree. So we can... People in our office, their kids, we bring them in, do the, all the recording and do that. So everyone, every activity has, you know, lessons and exercises they can do. The elephant is next to the balloon. So this is like, goes on like this. So you can do different, there are different pages here. Do it yourself. Hover on the objects at the bottom to see where to put them. So put now, the socks in the box. So you put it there. Put the puppy in the box. If you make a mistake, no. Put the pop. Put, put the suitcase on top of. Very interactive, fun, and, and, and hopefully, I mean, so what we tell the teachers, if you do this, your job is so much easier. You don't have to be lecturing for a whole 45 minutes in the class. The kids will be doing this. Now that's where then when we talk about making teachers as facilitators, this actually helps them understand this better. Now the teachers can walk around, see how the children are doing, who's struggling, so they can focus on students who are actually struggling. Also have students who are already ahead finished this can help the other students uh, their friends to do this. So this is just one example again. I mean, we have um, already created about 900 modules of, of learning content like this. They're all free, math, science. I mean, you can go and check it out later, epac.olenepal.org. I'm not going to go through all of them now. So that's that. Okay, back to the presentation. So the other content we have is the digital library. Um, the digital learning materials EPART is what we created. Now the library is where we bring together everything that everyone has made as much as possible. It's free and open. Okay. Uh, it's education focused digital library. Online and offline. So you can go online and check, you know, we have about 7,000 books here. Uh, in different categories. Uh, there are audiovisuals, learning software, reference materials, as you can see, they're all in there. They can search, you can browse, you can link. And this we started with the idea of promoting reading culture as well as to provide the students a platform where they can do research, exploration, sharing. This we actually install in small servers and put them in schools. Currently, there are about 900 schools and community libraries in Nepal who have this been using it. And this actually started back in 2009. There's another connection to Vancouver here, is with the support from Nepal Library Foundation. Uh, we started this development uh, of this digital library. And now, like I said, it's, it's way out there. And we also have an app now. So all the, uh, in all the schools and community libraries, it's an open, uh, uh, open network. So now we have an app, someone in the community has a phone, can come there, download books, download audiobooks, take them home, read, listen. So we're trying to, as much as possible, provide this access. So this is our way of providing access to a lot of learning materials. So 
a lot of work goes into trying to convince the publishers, the writers, the creators of different uh, uh, materials to allow us to put this in, in this library. So we don't put anything, we don't breach any copyright, so we have to get permissions to write. I'll put them here. And interestingly, most of the teachers, I mean uh, writers, especially the children's writers in Nepal, are more, more than happy to share uh, their books and, and uh, creations in this library. Demo, I'm not going to go through this now, but you can look at it, pustakale.org, and you can do search and then find out more about it. So our teacher training program, uh, the second part of what we do, it's not, so much, it's not really computer training. So whenever they think of uh, teacher training, they say, oh, they're going to, are you going to teach us how to use PowerPoint? Are you going to teach us how to use, you know, how to make, if they even ask if they can, we can help them make web pages. Uh, but it includes a very kind of three different aspects. They're pedagogical, there's the management and, and uh, technical aspects. And this is what we learned throughout many years. These are the areas where teachers need help in, in order for them to be able to integrate digital less, uh, lessons in their classrooms. The trainings are very hands-on. Right from day one, session one, we put the teachers in front of the laptops and computers and tell them to explore. So that's also to help them overcome the fear of technology. You know, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to break if you just keep using it. The idea is we try to make them, uh, to a, get them to a stage where they are going home and exploring, going to schools and learning more on their own. So both skills and confidence, very important to build the confidence among the teachers as well. And it's a three stage. So initially we had one training and then we came back and we found the teachers were struggling. So we felt we need to go to the schools and look at how they're doing. So that in-school training. And finally, we have this refresher training. So now what we do is when we start in a school, we actually sign an agreement with the school saying we will work together with you for one year. And then you will participate in this actively. At the end of one year, the schools have to be able to run this program on their own. And also what we find is that in the subsequent year, if another new teacher comes to the schools, the existing teachers should be able to teach the new teachers on how to use this in classrooms. And so far it has worked very well. So we have this three stage uh, training program that's spread over a year. So one little thing that you know, is very important to note here is that our success rate among teachers, and I'd say rate of adoption is about 40%. About 40% of the teachers that we've trained have actually gone on to do this. 40%, not the 40% says we're not gonna do it. About 20% are on the fence. So that's the kind of uh, success rate we have had with teacher training. This is a very good example of integration of technology in classroom. I really like this picture because you see the teacher, there is a lesson on the laptop about uh, measurements and the teacher is actually using a pencil there, showing the measurement to the teachers. The teachers, the students would do this activity on the laptop, it's a further reinforcement of what the teacher is teaching. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to promote is, it's not just using the laptops and, and the technology but do other things in the classroom. So it's together, that's actually the best way for the children to learn. So these are different stages of our, our training programs you can see there. We also added what we call the teaching and technology residency program. So especially in the remote areas where teachers have had no exposure to computers and technology before is for them, then what we do is we recruit young graduates we train them for about a month in our office and they go and live in these communities for four or five months. And they support 10 to 15 schools traveling around there providing and that has actually helped a lot as well. In terms of infrastructure, our goal is to not to put the latest technology in the schools, but we look at what works, what are kind of appropriate technology that will work in these areas and just to enable kind of teaching learning uh, in the classroom. So, in terms of hardware technology, you know, we are open to anything. So we've, we have many sc schools, especially in high schools, that use Raspberry Pi, the small computers. We use laptops in you know, some places. Mobiles, mobile phones, not so much used in classrooms, but then community members can use this. So we have that digital library server connected to the Wi-Fi there, and that would work there. So these are some glimpses. You know, these are solar panels in the school. This is a classroom with laptops. You can see the battery back up there, actually charged by the solar panels. And this is kind of teaching learning that's happening in the schools that we're trying to work. Community engagement, I've already mentioned this. Parent population, uh, participation. We actually have sessions where we bring the parents to the classrooms in the laptops, get them to use it, 
so they understand how the children are learning. And we encourage them to talk to the students at home about what they learn and also have the connection. And if you find out that the students have not been using the laptops for so many days, you should ask the teachers why then they are not doing it. So it's more participation. Instead of us monitoring these programs, we try to get the community members to be involved in it. So this is the overview of how we do it. So many of you might know about this laptop. This is what's called the one laptop per child that was started back in 2005, 2006. Um, in terms of uh, hardware, I think it's a very durable machine and we've been using it till now. We don't really follow it to the, uh, to the word about how that organization is doing about providing one laptop for every child around the world and waiting for miracles to happen. It's not going to happen. So for us, it's very important that it works in an ecosystem of training, support. But in terms of hardware, this is still a very good hardware that we use. So. So we currently have about almost 6,300 laptops that are deployed in the country by our organization, about 900 digital libraries, servers. We have over 400 Raspberry Pi computers, 35,000 students benefiting directly, about 200 remote schools that are using these resources, and we've trained about 1,100 trained teachers. Again, 40% of, I would say, are using this actively. So the, now finally we come to the results. So there have been a number of evaluation studies that have been done uh, over the years. Uh, there was a study that was done in the first year where we were quite surprised by the result. You know, we, we thought, well, I mean, you provide these resources in schools, how can it not improve learning, right? So that's what we thought. Well, we found out it wasn't, there was not much improvement. Then we went back to drawing boards. We actually did a lot of anal analysis and we found out that then that's when we use these evaluation studies to also learn, find out about the programmatic side of it. What are we doing right? What are we not doing right? One of the things we found out was that many schools, the teachers were not even applying what they learned in the training in, in the schools. And the first year we found out the teachers who actually came to the training weren't even teaching in this school, in these classes. They just came because they were close to the head teacher. And they came because they knew something about computers. So then, you know, we had to work with the local authorities, educational authorities, to make sure that the right teachers, the primary school teachers, actually come to this training. Um, so we looked, we looked at a lot of, of these studies to give us feedback, you know, what kind of training program was needed, what kind of content is needed. So that, that we, it helped us uh, to make the, our program more effective. And um, so what we also started doing back in 2012, 13 is instead of just doing this one-off evaluation, we started tracking the performance of teachers, of students over the years, and I'll share that with you. And uh, there have also been other third-party evaluations that have been done and that have shown there's quantitative as well as qualitative gains that we see in students. So this is a 2018 one. World Food Program is one of our programs in this area, uh, our partners, and this is what their evaluation results show that you know the students are actually more actively learning. The teachers also appreciate it, and there's more interaction among children in classrooms that uh, that they find in the studies. So overall, this is a student in uh, in 2015, the Bazang in one of the uh, West Far Western districts. This is kind of you know we're tracking the performance of students here. This is in Baitari 2007, Doti 2018. So this is baseline and midline. We still will do another one uh, in, in a year or two. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to share quickly a, a quick video on our, this program and in Darchula that will give you an idea. If I can get this to work.
our trainers and our, our program staff. So what are the lessons we've learned? What we see is what makes us very, uh, uh, what's very encouraging, it, it can work. I mean, if you look at this kind of school, I showed, showed you the picture earlier of these kind of classrooms, even this kind of setting, it is possible and we find that children are learning and they're more enthusiastic and they're learning on their own and they're more engaged in the learning. So management is very important. So one of the things we really emphasize in our training is not just the technical aspect, but how you manage, how do you set up your routine in classes? How do you make sure that you know, all the students are getting enough time here? So that, that management aspect is very important. What do you do if there's, if there's a problem with, with some of the equipment? And um, so we also find that the, there's continuous support. You know, teachers keep telling us, here, keep coming back. So that would actually give them sort of uh, confidence to, uh, to apply this in, in classrooms. And also like the behavioral change. Again, that's what we're trying to do here. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen in one year. It's going to be gradual. So I don't think, you know, it's even though sometimes it's uh, frustrating, we don't want to give up and we keep trying here. Um, we find lots of interest and enthusiasm in the, in the local level. So we see that as a very positive thing. And the big challenge here, again, is maintenance support. In these remote areas, if there's a problem, then we have to, our, our technical staff have to go and support it right now. But that is not sustainable. We, we realize that and we're looking at different ways to address that. Um, I'm not going to spend so much time. I just wanted to see where the government is. There is a lot of push there in the government. There's a lot of interest in plans and policies there. And um, there's an ICT and education master plan. That's one of the things that we also participated in, in to, uh, to uh, design and develop. As you can see, the four pillars are very similar to our four work areas, infrastructure, human resource development, digital content, and uh, education system enhancement. Uh, currently, uh, there has a lot of, been, lot of effort. So one of the things we stopped doing at Ole Nepal is we do not put so much effort into putting hardware in schools anymore because government is already doing it and the schools are doing it different means. Now what we work is with the schools with is how to use this hardware that you have in schools to promote learning. 
through content, through digital libraries, and through teacher training. That's what we actually focus on right now. Um, over the last two years, there has been a budget allocated by the government to about 4,000 schools. They each got 6,500 to promote e-learning. So that includes digital library as well as teacher training. So that has actually helped us to get digital libraries in about 900 schools. Because now the schools get this uh, direction from the Ministry of Education saying, you need to have a digital library and you know, 50,000 rupees for digital library, and that's where they come to us. Uh, human resource is still a big challenge for the, as a whole in the country to, uh, to introduce technology in classrooms, maintenance support. So looking ahead, the question for us is no longer whether, but how. You know, I don't think we're debating now whether we should use technology in classrooms or not. It is going to happen. Whether we like it or not, through other means, it's going to happen. But now for us is how do we do it? How do we make it more effective? How do we make sure that you know, uh, there are also negative aspects of technology that you know, it doesn't take over? So we want to focus on the positive aspect. How do we leverage it to uh, improve education? We also believe in blended learning environment. So it's not just technology all over, like I showed you earlier. Blended in the sense that you, know, you have students also interacting in different ways in classrooms. This is also doing more hands-on activities. This is also, I mean, in the university level, even in the online classes, blended learning is where you know, the groups, cohorts still meet once a week or twice a week, wherever they can. But it's a kind of different kind of way to do it in primary and school level. Um, I think the focus should now be more on creating more of the content, sharing that content, and, and making it widely available. Focus on learners, that's very important. That's at the center of everything. Maintenance support, we're looking at it. I think we need to build local capacity. Like I said earlier, we cannot have people going from Kathmandu to support all these remote areas. One thing we are looking at is, like I said earlier, there is this vocational stream in high school. Now maybe if you can tie up with them and then have those students there in the, in the remote areas to support uh, programs in, in primary levels. And very important is, in terms of teacher education, we are looking into sort of, we have had talks with Kathmandu University about how we can all the things that we have, our knowledge and our experience, if we can somehow share it with educational institutions, and then those who are actually preparing teachers can also incorporate there in their programs. That's it. Thank you very much. Sorry, there's a microphone. Um, so we uh, now have time for uh, questions, and uh, please go ahead. Yes. And if you could introduce yourself uh, when you speak, that would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, and we're going to use the mic for the people that are watching online, because you can't hear it otherwise without this. So thanks for, yeah, and also just for the speaker tonight. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kapil Ragmi. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Educational Studies. Uh, I'm interested in the partnership OLE has with the Ministry of Education. Uh, from your presentation, I understand that they invited uh, uh, OLE for making ICT master plan, and you got indirect or direct support uh, for this uh, from the ICT part that Ministry had, it, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of partnership you have with the Ministry of Education, can you explain a bit more? And can you also add where the funding comes from per OLE. Okay. So in terms of partnership, we, for the, ever since 2007, <coughs> we have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Education, and we went later on also with different agencies within the Ministry of Education, including the Curriculum Development Center and the National Center for Educational Development, which now is merged with Department of Education now. National Center for Education Development is responsible for training the teachers. So <clears throat> that partnership was, uh, at the beginning, was the pilot. See how we can use it in classrooms. And then it, uh, in, the success, in the subsequent years, it was to expand the use in different districts and also to create content 
and to create this teacher training package and to train teachers. So this, that's a partnership that we have had. So all the content, I mean, I don't know if you're aware that you need to have the kind of authorization from the ministry to work in public schools. Because you really, uh, the, the reason behind that is they really don't want any, anyone to just come in there and go to schools and start teaching however they want to do it, right? So all the content that we created, like I said, the EPAC, they're all reviewed and approved by this Curriculum Development Center. So they have different subject committees. They go through it and they give feedback and we do change a few things that, that, are very, uh, that need to be changed. So we have engaged them a lot in this whole process. In, in the initial years, we actually got them to also come work with us to design and conceptualize these activities. But lately, we haven't been so successful in that. But still, we send them for review and approval is done. In the training, we've also used many government trainers. We did a, a, a master trainer uh, training and then used their, the, the uh, government trainers to do training in the district as well. Because eventually, like I said, our goal here is to make this kind of teaching learning methodologies and approach available to all the schools, and all in Nepal will not be able to do it. So we want to make it part of the education plans and policies, which is happening now. Now, so if the government trainers can do the training, then we don't have to do it. It's not possible for us to train all the teachers, right? So we are trying to work with that more and more, and especially now with the new SSDP, the school sector development plan that the government has. That's where you know, using ICT is, uh, is, is in every aspect of, of the program, in teacher training, in service delivery, in, in content. So uh, we are going to, again, work with the ministry and, and, and the government in trying to share what we've learned in, in, in this training there. So in terms of uh, funding, uh, we have a very interesting model. So to work on, in the far western district, in these uh, areas, we have an agreement with the World Food Program. World Food Program gets funding from USDA. So what happened was back in 2009, when we had this meeting with World Food Program, we learned that they had this uh, school meals program, which provides afternoon meal to students in these really remote areas, food scarce areas. So that is an incentive for the parents to send the children to school because they will get an afternoon meal, a nutritious meal. So I remember I had this meeting with the head of World Food Program and he said, you know, yeah, you've been very successful in getting the, schools, the, the students to come to schools, but do you know what's happening in school? Are they actually learning? You know, so that's actually started this whole journey. And so now what we do is World Food Program supports all the programmatic aspect of uh, training, of monitoring, all the support. And since they also have the resources there, that also helps. Uh, as you can imagine, I mean, there are not many organizations working in these areas because it's very expensive. You know, the cost per child to bring this kind of program there is very expensive. To go to Darchula, I don't know if you're, how, you have to fly to Dhangari, which costs about over $200 to fly there. Then you get on a vehicle, you go and stay one night in Darchula, I mean, sorry, Dardeldura, and the next day you go to Darchula, and from there you walk another four or five hours to get to the schools, right? And so this is very expensive to, uh, to run a program like that. So that's why, you know, the partnership with World Food Program helps. And the deal is that we raise the funds for laptops and they do the programmatic aspects. So for the laptops, we do fundraising through friends and different means, and that's how we do it. For the content development, we again write grant proposals, different uh, 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 sources, uh, we do it. So for upgraded, we've already finished. Now you know, we're working on a grant proposal to, do, to uh, get funding for grade nine and 10. Then especially since everything we create is free, so we are sort of being able to get that kind of funding. And there's also now sort of interest from other countries as well. Especially if you like a math and science, the curriculum is pretty much similar across everywhere in the world. So since we can provide this source code for this, all they have to do is maybe change a few sort of graphical elements and then uh, change the uh, language, the XML layer, then you can have it in different languages as well. And we also have now different organizations who want to do this. So they invest everything, and then we just do the training and set up and support for them. That's also happening. Hi, excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Shashi. I teach at the uh, School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, so I was in Nepal about a month ago, my first visit to Nepal, and 
So it was quite nostalgic to see some of those pictures there. So my question is, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, the enrollment has gone up, or I assume that the quantitative improvement is also uh, reflected in the increased enrollment in the schools. So I would presume that a higher enrollment and better uh, response from the students would mean that there is more pressure on the teachers to perform. And in your original present or in your earlier presentation, you had mentioned that holding the teachers accountable for their work was a big challenge. Has this actually resulted in a pushback from them? Because uh, I mean, I, I'm from India and I've seen teachers you know, resist any attempt or any reform that will make them more accountable. Because as you said, most of them are busy earning other things. Uh, so what has been the response from the teaching community, particularly those 40 percent who didn't like the idea, was there any pushback? Okay. So when I talked about the enrollment, increase in enrollment, I wasn't talking so much about um, due to our program. There is some there. What I was talking about is in the primary level, our enrollment rate is very high, 96 percent. That is because, like I said, there are certain incentives the schools get for the number of students that they enroll. So they, their focus is only on enrolling, not so much teaching. Right? Also, the school's fear, the biggest fear that the public schools have is if they run out of students, then they will, they will have to close the school down. So this kind of very cushy job that the teachers have, living there, you know, kind of thing, that will go away. So they will keep pushing. They will you know, even sometimes inflate the numbers to show that they have this high enrollment. But if you look at subsequent years, the, the numbers just drop. For our program schools, yes, there have been like places where the number of the enrollment has gone up, but it doesn't go up so much because since we work in this mountain hill areas, there are not many students around there. So uh, pretty much all the students are coming to schools, but the uh, attendance is much better. But attendance also, we don't see a drastic increase because they're already coming for food. Right? But what we find is that they stay in school even after lunch. Previously, they eat the lunch and they go away, but now they, you find that they're staying till the end of, 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 the, of the school. And what about the accountability of teachers? That's a big challenge that I don't think we as an organization can tackle that. Um, we still struggle a lot with that. So there's the hierarchy, there's the lack of accountability, but what we try to do is try to give more positive feedback to teachers, you know, try to you know, show them you know, this is how different you're making. Or, even like we can, which is not far-fetched, we say, you know, this is something that's innovative, something new that you're doing. You're actually a pioneer in this. You know, this is a skill that can be very helpful for you in the future as well. So we try to work with teachers as much as possible to make that happen. Uh, my name is Drona Rasali. Uh, your presentation was quite enlightening uh, in the remote villages of Nepal. Uh, um, this computer literacy is coming uh, at home for them. Uh, and you touched on about the disparity, uh, inequities that exist in the society. Uh, and you also mentioned about ethnicity as a factor. Uh, I was just wondering how you are addressing the inequity uh, disparity uh, across. Especially, I'm concerned about the uh, rate of dropouts uh, in the schooling uh, is so high. As you had shown, only 10% get to 10, grade 10. And uh, most of them are from the uh, uh, traditionally what are known as lower uh, ethnic groups, lower, lower uh, disadvantaged people uh, in these schools, how, how uh, you have a plan to address that. And also, the question I'm asking is basically a state responsibility, not your responsibility, uh, how you are energizing the state uh, to address that. So how are we addressing the disparity? First, we're actually going to these communities working, right? So we're in the remote areas in Darchula, in uh, Baitari, in Bazan, we're working in the schools. What that has done is, uh, yes, it's a responsibility to the state, but previously we had to rely on the central government. Now we see much more interest from the municipalities. 
So for example, in, in Darsula, we work, one of the municipalities we work with was Marma, and we have covered eight schools there. The local municipality is in, interested in investing and making sure we go to more schools. So the way to address the disparity is actually go and provide this kind of resources there. And what we also uh, see happening is that when students get exposure to this kind of learning, teaching learning materials, and then they're interested in learning, they're more likely to come to schools. So why the reason that many times the students do not want to go to schools is because they're not enjoying it. Because, you know, the teacher's there, the teacher can be very strict, they're not, they don't feel like they're learning, they're not enjoying it. But now that, you know, if you can see uh, in the study that was, that was commissioned by USDA, <coughs> And that where, the, where there's more and more they find is students are actually excited about coming to school, about you know, being able to use the computers. If you imagine these kids who had no exposure till then, not even a television, now they get to interact and work and learn in this kind of environment, there's obviously going to be interest. So our target, the way our Ola Nepal has been working is we have been working predominantly in these kind of marginalized communities in these areas. We have also tried to make some content in different languages. Again, we would rely on different groups to do it because the content is already there. But we have also uh, made some content in Chepang language, and we have used them in, in schools in Chitwan, in the hills there. So uh, like we've been working for about 10 years, and then I think we've also learned, we're also learning going along the way. But now that we have this uh, content and this knowledge, we are looking forward to actually sharing that and making it more available to other ethnic groups and, and uh, communities as well. Yeah, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, my name is Dagmar Schwerk. I am teaching at the Department of Asian Studies, Tibetan Studies. I'm also part of the Himalaya program. And uh, my question concerns the education of teachers. You have mentioned it as the future goal to update the um, education of teachers, so start not with the existing teachers, but with the future t uh, uh, teachers. I have no idea what it looks like and what it needs to become a teacher from the curriculum. What can you say something about that and ideas, what you would like to change in future, what are your ideas? That, so that would be nice, thanks. So I believe the, in, the, in the system now, in order to be a high school teacher, you need to have a master's in education. In order to be a basic, skill, basic uh, level teacher, you have to have a B.Ed., a bachelor in education. So bachelor of education would typically cover all the you know, education fundamentals, teaching, learning, and they also have uh, one semester where they have to go and work in a school. So um, one of the things we'd like to, and, and um, to one university, one of the universities in Nepal also has uh, um, ICT in education sort of uh, uh, line there. I think you can do masters in that as well. But I look at the curriculum and still does not address, you know, the practical aspect of, of how, how, how to do these things. So. We haven't been very successful in trying to work with Purim University to change that, but with Kathmandu University, we have had a few conversations. What we want to do, I think, ideally what we'd like to do is share our experience, our knowledge, and, and what we have in terms of training practice, and work with them, and again, they would probably be best in designing a curriculum around that. So even to have an elective on you know, using technology in classrooms, and that does not mean like learning how to use PowerPoints, you know, but about using digital resources and sub different subjects in classrooms. That would be a first step that you know, I see happening uh, that we'd like, to, we'd like to do. And also like that part where they actually go and support the schools. Uh, it's not support, it's what's called the practice teaching. If we can have few of them who actually do the similar work that you know, what our teaching in uh, technology residents are doing, so if we can work with them to sort of give them the, because the residents are not really education majors, not all of them are education majors. There are some who are engineering majors, there are some who are actually uh, social work majors, but then they understand you know, the basic fundamentals of teaching learning and then working with children. They, as long as they enjoy working with children, then you're okay for it. So if we can work with that B ed students who are, have to go to work in schools, if we can work with them to give them the kind of basic skills, then they can be supporting the schools. So there'll be, that means we can suddenly have like thousands of students who can actually be supporting these schools. And I know in the far west there are a number of education schools 
that we can work together if it's actually part of the curricula. Thank you, Raviji, for an excellent presentation. My name is Suresh Vata, by the way. Uh, just a generic uh, or sort of rather curious uh, curiosity that what, um, I guess, proportion of their school hours they spent doing this interactive learning, you, you mentioned in the context of the blended learning. Mm -hmm. um, so the schools actually make a part of the teacher training at the end, they actually make this kind of routine, right, this weekly schedule. and. Uh, so if you look at the schedule, if, if you're a grade two student, over one week period, they will get about six periods. But then also we encourage the teachers to open it up during lunch or sometimes in some schools they have to do after schools where kids are free to come and explore and do things on their own. So the way we work is for every school, no matter what hardware we use, it could be computers, it could be laptops, it could be Raspberry Pi devices, is that we make sure that there are enough devices that when one class is using it, every child has one-to-one -one interaction. So it's not like three kids per uh, machine. That one-to-one -one is very important because, again, we want the students to learn at their own pace and just spend as much time as they want in certain s slides if they need to go back and do that. So um, that way, if it make a kind of, if you have a basic school and if you make a routine, we find that the, the kids have about six periods. Plus, then they have other times when they can explore the e-pustakale and also go back and do some activities if they want to. So fair to say that their entire school day is spent doing this interactive learning? No. That would, no. no, no. So in one week. Oh, one week. Yeah. Oh. yeah, one Sorry. week. Because like, if you look at, like, if you make a seven, if there are seven periods per day, oh. grade two will use it for English, grade three will use it for math. You know, that's why you have, if you look at the combination of different subjects and grades, then they get about six periods per week. Thank you. So when the teachers actually design it, if you are teaching, let's say, fraction division, then we'll start, they can, it's different depending on the kind of topic. Sometimes the teacher will spend a whole period just in the classroom teaching about this or doing activities, but they'll say, okay, tomorrow we'll do this on the laptop. So when the kids go to the laptop school, they already understand, okay, we're learning about fraction division, the teacher had taught something, Sometimes it can be something they start with the laptops and then come to class and again do this. So it's just that kind of integration that, that we emphasize on. Well, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. My name is Adam Sheard. I am a student here at the LLED and I focus on a lot of uh, language learning through technology. And one thing that I was curious about is since you've integrated or these, these laptops and this e-learning program, how has... Uh, how has testing and assessment changed? Or have you, has anything happened? Or are people still using paper tests? Like, are they using this just for that? Or are you able, because I saw some of the activities in the video there, it seemed the students were selecting some answers. And so if they do a wrong answer, is the teacher being informed of this? Or uh, things like that. And the second part is, how much is the program, or how much has it become more student-centered since even you've started this program. Uh, it seems like the students are getting a lot more time to work on the laptops and do stuff, and you were just mentioning in a moment ago, in their own time, they can do stuff. But so how, how much has this changed, and do you, are you aiming to have it change even more student-centered in the future? I think you mentioned that a bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, right, so very, very good question about the testing and exams. So sometimes what we find is that, you know, they have uh, the final exams in the schools are uh, administered by the resource center. So that the, the tests still come from the, from the resource centers. They send this paper test that, that, that the teachers have to administer in the classroom. And I remember like some schools a month before the exam, they stopped using the laptops. So no, no now we have to start preparing for the exams. <laughs> So it's still, that, that mindset is still there. And of course, the question in, in the exam is going to be directly the story from the book about you know, what did the lion do to the mouse or rabbit or something like that, right? So they have to read that. So the exam, uh, the change uh, in the exam is still not there yet and it's not in our hands, so we cannot really do much about it, so that's still a problem. But what, what I also sort of, uh, what we also keep saying is that you know, as long as the kids, if you, if you tease them, to think for themselves, to be creative, to learn the basics,
they should be able to do well in the exams. So that, that's what we try to push for that. Um, the teachers cannot, right now, we have also developed an assessment system. Um, that's a prototype right now. Right now, what you see in the activities, every activity has a lesson and exercise. But then you can see, that you can hear the feedback, you know, in, is correct or uh, incorrect. So what the teachers do is, if you hear too many incorrects coming from this corner, then you, that kid needs help. So that's the way we've done it. Rather than, you know, uh, we can actually grab all the scores and put it in the server, but we know the teachers never want to look at it. So it is that. But the assessment system is something that we're developing right now that will actually give the overall picture. And uh, so that can actually be something that we will try in the coming year this year. Uh, hi, I'm Aditya Sarma. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. I have a quick question about uh, very basic things, like how do you define the quality of education? And the second part, even now you are, you are like having a program over there in a remote area, Bajang and Darjula. What are your plan to sustain these things? whenever there is no food, like a World for Food or any supporting funding agency is not available. Because we have seen this in the past, like in Nepal, if program come in by supporting from us. So what is your plan to develop community to sustain this program within that community? So I just want to know okay. about that. Thank you. The first question about quality. So how do you define quality? I know it's a, a difficult one to define, but instead instead of trying to define what quality or trying to make a benchmark, what we do is, when we talk about quality, there are two aspects that we look at. One is the kind of materials that the students are using to learn with. So we're going from textbook, as you can see, very black and white, basic, boring, and very difficult to sort of decipher that kind of textbook. Now we're going to content that's fun, interactive, getting feedback, right? So, and listening, audio, visual, everything. So we, that is what, in terms of content learning materials, we see, uh, we, we mean when we say quality, right? So you, it's based on the curriculum, so it's something you need to learn about, let's say, putting numbers in order in grade two, you have to learn. So instead of just telling this is bigger than this, now they're actually doing it themselves. So when they, they're putting the numbers in order, if they're not in order, then it's going to correct, they get feedback, they can look at hints, they can do that. So that is what we mean by quality learning, quality in terms of content. The other aspect of quality is the teaching learning methodology. So if you just have a teacher giving a lecture, the kids are sitting there passively, I don't think the students are actually getting quality learning opportunities. But, you know, using technology, again, I mean, you don't have to use technology. I always say, if you have an excellent teacher there with eight students, I think the teacher can do an amazing job without technology. But the reality is that, you know, we have teachers who are not motivated, there are teachers who are not qualified. But then in that kind of scenario, how can we, you know, leverage technology is, you know, you change the kind of dynamics in the classroom where the kids are actually doing it. The teachers have no choice now. That is a learner-centered classroom already because when the kids are engaged doing it and they're learning and they're actually asking. So that's the other aspect of quality that, that we look at. In terms of sustainability, it's, it's a very good question. It's very important to us. And um, our, we, our goal is not to go into a school or for a uh, 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 a uh, year and leave. So that is the very reason that in 2007, the month after we registered our organization, we went to the ministry. So our, we see our role as an organization is not to like keep doing this for 20 years. Actually, we were very ambitious in, the, in 2007. We thought we'd be out of this by in, in five years' time. We say, you know, this is, we're going to do it, we're going to demonstrate it, we're going to document it, and then the government will take it up and it'll be in all the schools. They even had, didn't happen that fast, but it is going in that direction. Like I was mentioning earlier, there is the ICT and Education Master Plan. And then what our programs have given is an opportunity for people to see how it happens. You know, it's not happened before. So it's one thing to sort of read about it, but to go to a classroom and to see it and interact with teachers and the parents get feedback, that can be very sort of uh, instrumental in designing the right kind of plans and policies. So. In, in terms of if you look at that investment that government is making, so this year, last year and this year, 4,000 schools got $6,500 each. That's a huge investment. So that right now is the government's focus is in the secondary schools. 
So eventually, that's the plan is, according to the master plan, is also then go to the uh, lower secondary and primary. So eventually, what we see happening is a lot of this investment that right now is coming from donors is going to come from the government. And we're not going to need more funding to make content because it's already there, right? And we don't need much more funding to do, train the teachers because there's already a system. The government already has a training system. There's training programs. You just have to add this component in the training program. So the sustainability we see is it has to be taken up by the government. And um, so it was more difficult to convince the central government. But now if you with the local government, it's so much interest. There is like a lot of, you know, if you just go there, and there are even like some business, you know, businesses going there and making money out of, you know, trying to give. And, and then in Darzula, in the Bias municipality, which is in the north side of Darzula, uh, we found out that someone had gone there and then sold e EPAC for 10,000 rupees to the schools. So that's happening. But the idea is now is, is uh, the initial cost investments already been made. And I think it's much easier for government or anyone to take this up and, and bring to the schools. Thanks. Robbie, thank you. Um, I'm uh, going to ask you a faculty of education question. And uh, <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a data geek My question. Disclaimer, I don't also. have an education background. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, we talk a lot in education. One of the buzz phrases that gets spoken about in education research is really asking about evidence of impact even while we acknowledge that it's very complex. And um, I really wanted to add, push you a little bit. You shot through a few slides of graphs mm -hmm. that were very hard to see. And I wanted to give you another opportunity to show us if, if there are highlights that you'd like to point to, if there's any of, the, any of the research or evidence you've been able to collect so far that you would cite as evidence of impact or, or evidence that you're having an effect. Okay. So I can go back and show you some. Of, so that's the, the graph that we showed was when we're tracking the students, their performance. In terms of academic uh, or scientific research and evaluation, that probably is not going to hold water because you need to have the control group, you need to do comparison and doing all of that. So that's, an, that's something that we've been sort of hoping to find someone who would be willing to do that, right? So for us, if we do it, we'll implement in agencies. It's not good. And some of the evaluations that have been done in the past has been done very, you know, I find it very surprising that, you know, they designed this very nice and well, and then someone goes to the school one day or, like, spends two hours, comes back with the results. So uh, we... In terms of evaluation evidence, uh, we'd love to have someone who actually we can work with, spend a lot of time there and, and effort in collecting that. What we're more interested for us is, uh, the aspect that's very important for us is the content that we're making, how much of a difference that content is making. So that's, that's one aspect if anyone wants to do it. I mean, I can show you the graphs again, but that's more of a... Uh, So uh, this is in Bazan. We have, I don't know how many schools here, about 10, 13, 13 schools here in one phase. So uh, this is uh, between 2013 and 2015, in two years' time, different schools. This is an average of, the, of different subjects. And this one shows you the three core subjects in English, science, and math. So English, you went over 49 was the baseline to 68, and then 59 to 79. So some of the schools actually show a lot of difference. But if there are schools that are already performing well, I think the incremental is uh, uh, small there. And this is grade-wise, grade 2, 3, and 4. So this is just the, the, the survey we do in different uh, intervals. showing. And we also sort of compare this against the school's own, like the annual, their uh, results that they send to district education offices. And it sort of shows the kind of similar uh, we see corresponding gains there as well. So is that the, sorry, is that the comparative grade? This is not comparative. No, this is before. This is basically we're just tracking the students. No. They're in grade two. They go to grade three. They go to grade four. And then we look at like, you know, so in math, this is the overall we see. But in grade two, this is the kind of average increase we see in uh, 
average, average performance? Yeah, so this is like for grade two English, math, and science average, their average went from 52 to 65. So that would be the qualitative, so this is the thing that the, uh, the firm that WFP hired to do this, their study, is, this is what we, we've also done one in 2000, there's focal group discussion interviews, and uh, so that was actually where we found out where the, the, the parents talk about the students coming home and telling them about what they learned on laptop, and then uh, they're actually interested in going to schools, and especially in, in the far west where they speak dotely, the parents were in very excited that the kids now are learning Nepali. And the next thing they, they said was, can you teach them English as well? Yeah. So that's. Um, yeah. Uh, you have partially um, answered my question already. Uh, yeah, I'm Sanjida. I'm associated with the uh, CSER, Center for in, um, India and South Asia Research. Um, so I was wondering about the you know, um, economic activities you know, alongside or behind uh, the integration of techno technology, you um, argued that it is um, the most cost, uh, cost eff effective way to um, Im improve the uh, quality of education. And, um, you know, um, the materials, the laptops that the students are getting, who, who are uh, making, producing those materials, are those imported or you know, how is the local um, economic system or the technology sector um, taking part, participating in this whole process? And is there any um, sort of like, oh, uh, the, the um, solar pa panel that you showed, right? So it's really impacting not just the schools, but probably the local economy as you, uh, other businesses and everything. So is there any other cascading sort of effects of this? integration of technology into, and, and whether it would make a better argument, you know, for uh, this kind of uh, qualitative change to, to be made in this sector, things like that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent point. Sadly, I think the solar panels are installed by firms in Kathmandu, not the local ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is very difficult for us to, like, find a vendor that's even in, in, in a town nearby and try to manage that it's very difficult you know, to make sure. So that's why we still we do the kind of bidding in Kathmandu and then we have our requirements, we work with them. Um, and uh, eventually there will be. Uh, so one of the things I pointed out earlier, with the vocational stream in grade 9 to 12, if there are students who, are, you know, uh, who learn about computer maintenance, right now there are a lot of, lot of young people who can maintain phones, right? I mean, they can, they can fix phones. So if there is, it's all about supply and demand. So if there are more and more schools have these uh, devices and computers, there's a demand for maintenance, and obviously there will be supply there. And especially now with the vocational training, if we can work with these kind of programs and someone can set up a small business to support this, that will eventually happen. But I don't think we've reached the critical mass for that to happen yet. Uh, hello, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Akhil, I'm a program assistant here at CESAR. Um, so my question was that the 40% of teachers um, who get training um, but then don't implement that training in the classroom, as well as the 20% that you were saying are kind of on the fence, um, do you know the reasons as to why they haven't been implementing the training? Um, and for the 20% that are on the fence, um, is anything being done uh, to maybe encourage them to get on your side of the fence um, or to figure out what those issues are and then to make those changes um, in the training that's already there? Thank you. So the 40% who are not doing it, lack of motivation, right? And no one can tell them they have to do it. So we're just an organization going there to work. Although we have partnership with the government, it's just basically, it's just saying, why should we do it kind of question. So like I said earlier, they're like, no, it's working however we're doing it. So they're already, there's already this lack of motivation to do anything better. So it's not going to change them. The ones on the fence, what we do is, like I said, we have these programs where we go back to the schools. You know, we, we have in-school training. We encourage them. And I'll, sometimes it is also the issue of hierarchy. So the 20% of the funds, there might be a, a senior teacher who is interested but sort of not sort of open to asking help from the younger teachers. So what we do is kind of try to, 
when you do the in-school training, when one teacher is teaching, we have the other teachers also sit in the classroom and observe. And then we encourage them to talk to each other, sort of say, okay, what is your feedback? The trainer would be the last one to speak usually. It's usually more self-reflection, have the teachers also have peer reflection. So that's how we encourage more dialogue in classes. And we keep trying to show them that you, know, you can help each other so much here. So that's one way that we try to get more teachers on board here. But the 40% who are not doing it, some might be just close to retiring. You know, and then I also understand some of them, like, you know, for them, like, it's, it's very kind of daunting, right? Having a, a, a device that they've never used before and having to use that in classroom to teach 40 kids is going to be quite, quite challenging. So we do realize that as well. Um, if we were there more, I think, especially with the residency program, that helps a uh, certain number of teachers who are on the fence or even the 40% to sort of warm up to these ideas. But then otherwise, you know, it, it is a very challenging thing for them as well. So it's lack of motivation as well as the kind of fear of not being able to do it. So one of the biggest fears I think the teachers have in Nepal is that going to a classroom and then the teachers sort of, I mean the students, and, and sort of finding that the students know more than you do, right? So that's another thing that we cover a lot in training is to say that, you know, information is out there. There's in, access to information is there. So just because your students know more does not mean the teachers are not needed. So how can you turn that into a fun kind of uh, learning experience is if, if a student asks a question is tell them, why don't you go and find out in the library, come back and share with us. You know, that's a similar kind of uh, approach that our trainers take in, in, in training program as well, is we encourage them to find the answers themselves. One of the very interesting things that happens in our, in our training is on the first day, the first two sessions, they get an introduction to this, the, the laptops and the content, they try it out a little bit. And at the end of the first day, this is a seven day long training, then the question is, if you were to take this to your classroom, these laptops, this content to your classroom, what are the problems you'll face? What are the reasons you think you won't be able to do it? And the trainers would list down all the points that, that they say, you know, because the kids are not going to listen to us. What if the, some of the laptops don't work? All these things are listed. On the final, they go through that list again. Very interestingly, almost all the training, the, the teachers find out that they actually know the answers. And the answers actually came from them. You know? So to give them that confidence is that you know, with the fundamentals of teaching and learning do not change because you put a computer in classrooms, right? The fundamentals are still the same. The principles are still the same. All you have is a new tool and how best to use that to reach your goal and to make your lessons more interesting and, and fun and actually reach your goal. So, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of approach that we've been taking. Hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Wu, I'm the senior student in UBC. And I just have a simple question about, because uh, on the website, it's the ePass content on many about uh, grade two to grade eight. So I'm wondering if you'd plan to develop a similar program for adolescents after grade eight, so they can actually um, get more study and learn into the advanced education. Right, so we have actually grade one to eight. The website needs to be updated, so we've also done grade one. The, initially, we only started with grade two because in 2007, there was no early childhood ECD classes not, did not exist. So grade one was when the kids first came to school. We felt the first year they need to you know, get used to the new environment in school. So from grade two on, they can still use the laptops. But then now that there's all the ECD schools, our kids are already coming to school a year before the first grade, so we started the grade one as well. And uh, so I, I, like I mentioned earlier, we do have plans to go on to grade nine and 10 and make content for that as well. But eventually, I think for the higher grades, I don't think there's so much need for us to actually create many of the content because once they have the, once they master English language, there's so much content already available out there that they can use to learn as well. So uh, that's why we emphasize a lot on the early grades up to grade eight. But nine and 10, we still do have plans. I just want to ask, um, since you are taking technology like laptops into like remote regions which may have not seen this kind of technology before, 
Um, I know your hands are full with like the education part of it, but has there ever been like a thought or consideration towards like using that technology for say adult education and like say public health or sex education or women's health in these regions, which you know, um, on say behalf of the government or as a private institution mm -hmm. organization? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there's so many possibilities that open up, right? And then we have to stay focused on what we do. Um, having said that, it's. Uh, we found out a school in Kapilvastu, actually we read it in the paper later, we found that the school was using these laptops to do adult education for mothers. So later we, when we were at the school, I asked the principal, the head teacher, and he said, two mothers came to them and said, oh, I'm, our kids are learning this, can we also use this to learn? And what he told the two mothers was, I won't do it for two of you, but if you bring 20 mothers, then I'll make sure that two teachers stay after school every day to teach you this. And it's had so they has been used to some extent like that. Uh, in terms of sex education and other possibilities, what we do is instead of going to the schools and try to promote it, we create this kind of content. So recently we made two uh, animation videos on uh, child marriage against child marriage, and um, also on uh, parental involvement in education. So we share that to the digital library and it's out there, and then in training and in our community interaction program, we show that to them, but we leave it up to them. And there's very interesting, I mean, the digital library is what sort of we use to uh, provide access to many of these contents, although we don't actively do it. Um, very interesting one, there's, I think there was a, it was done by Peace Corps, something called, What If There's No Doctor? Yeah. So there's a booklet on that, and there's actually a video now on Made That, so we make that available there. So if someone has a broken, bone something, what to do, so they can watch the video and learn. So um, there are other content that there's an organization called Practical Action. They made a lot of interesting videos about, you know, about livelihood, about beekeeping, about education. So all of these are available on the, on the digital library. So that's you know, how we provide access. But actively, I don't think we as an organization have the bandwidth to cover other things outside of the formal and to some extent non-formal education right now. Hey, well, thank you very much, Ravi. You've really covered a huge amount of ground there. And I think having worked in rural Nepal for many years myself, it's truly inspiring uh, to hear someone with your vision uh, and also the commitment to working through all of these challenges. I think uh, hearing the humility with which you acknowledge the challenges and the limitations you faced, uh, but have constantly striven to uh, find ways around them and make creative partnerships with the government and other organizations, it's really very inspiring. Um, so I'd like to thank Thank you again on behalf of all of our co-sponsoring organizations, Himalaya Program, CSAR, uh, LLED, UBC Language Sciences, and Nepal Library Foundation. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Canada. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think finally I do want to mention that, you know, although I'm standing here in front of you, Ole Nepal is an organization of wonderful, about 2025, 20, dedicated, committed people. So just a shout out to my team there. <laughs> Some amazing trainers. I mean, one thing I remember is when we were going to the far west, I was going uh, to Bazang about two years ago, and the driver we hired to go from Dhangadi to there. It was very interesting. What he told me was, oh, sir, your organization, the field staff are amazing. Mm. Because he said it was a rainy time, and then they'd get off the vehicle, and then they said, two days later, we'll meet you at this point. And it was raining, and then he said, you don't see many people doing that. And I said, he went there and waited, and they actually come after two days. Mm -hmm. So the schools that we go to is, uh, we do make a lot of effort in getting to schools that no one goes to, and that's very important to us. And again, I mean, I can't take the credit for that. It's, it's a very amazing kind of team that we have and who actually believe in our cause, and that's what's actually helped us going for this long. And a lot of our partners who supported us and believed in us. And thank you for having me here today. It's been a joy sharing what we do, and hopefully, you know, we'll be, I'll come back in the next 10 years and have better stories to share here. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you.